Hey guys, this is, uh, this is fun for me. At least I hope it's going to be fun. I, I don't often get to teach and um, the only time I do is when God puts something on my heart. And uh, Months ago, Kenny said, hey, if you want to teach sometime and record it and put it on, what's, what's the web? Uh, rise Above Recovery. Rise Above Recovery dot org. org. That's where you can go to, to find some good teaching. And hopefully tonight's included by the Holy Spirit. It will be good teaching. I know this. I know God's put some things on my heart. So I, I just pray that, that he would allow those to come through. So let's, let's do that right now. Father God, those things that you've put on my heart, those things you've quickened my spirit with, God, would you bring them forward by your Holy Spirit tonight and, and uh, just help me to stay out of the way and um, to allow your goodness to shine through. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so a little poem here to start off. It's called Such a Pity by Linda King. Licking and licking my wounds in my room, holding with care the dark cloud of gloom. My fragile emotions I must protect. It's such a pity that they've been bruised and wrecked. I cuddle my hurt feelings, encourage tears to flow. The quote unquote, I've really got it rough thoughts continue to grow. Now in the dark, the Lord turns on the light and asks, Is this how warriors learn how to fight? Is this how warriors pull down strongholds? Did I say retreat? Put on your armor. There won't be defeat. Then into the battle like a, slow, a soldier with Jesus first in mind, I took up my shield of faith and I left those feelings behind. We're going to be mainly in Revelation 12 tonight. The middle verses, 10 to 12, somewhere in there. So let's, uh, let's read that. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God both day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives. See, this is what Satan does. He's been distracting me all week. And uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't like it when God's word is brought forward. So we're going to read it again. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God both day and night have been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. That last portion is, is to come. Satan is still in heaven, uh, accusing us. He's... he's talking to Jesus and pointing to us, saying, look, look at where he gave me permission in his life. And where we give Satan permission in our life, God has to back off. Does anybody agree with that? Yes. I can testify to that personally. It's how I ended up in prison. And it's also why I can stand before you today. Because... I'm learning a little better how to say no to Satan and yes to Jesus. Amen. 
So let's, let's pick apart these verses a little bit because there's some really crucial things in there. Back up to verse 11. They triumphed over him. Who is they? They is us, the church. In the Bible, there's what they call type and shadows of things. And it's appropriate and applies across the board to the church. In the end days, which we're living in now, it's going to be more and more that we need to overcome the attacks of the enemy. And so the first thing we read is they triumphed over him. So they is us, the church. We are the church. Triumphed, we overcame the enemy. I told you a little bit about my life just a second ago, how I've been an overcomer in certain areas and my desire is to continue to be an overcomer for the glory of the Lord the rest of my days. I wanna finish strong. I wanna finish strong. And I hope you guys do too. So they overcame and triumphed. They were victorious. Go to Ephesians 6, 10 and 12. Ephesians 6, 10 and 12 through 12 says, this is Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So that's where our battle is. Our battle's in the spirit world. Our battle's in the mind. And that's where Satan likes to play. But we can be victorious over him by capturing all those thoughts and holding them captive to what God says about those thoughts. Whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, what is of good repute. Think on these things. And the rest of it, hand over to God. Those things that are not of him, let him deal with them. So we triumph over who? We triumph over Satan. It says, they triumphed over him. We're already more than conquerors, amen? Jesus has already run, won the battle. And what does Jesus say about us? The Bible is replete with confession to that degree. First Timothy says, we will have eternal glory. Romans 3 says, we are justified. We have been declared righteous. Romans 8 says, there is now therefore no condemnation for us. Also, we are set free from the power of sin. First Corinthians, we're sanctified, made holy in Christ. Again, in 1 Corinthians, we are pure and holy in Jesus. We will be given new life at the resurrection. So we've been made holy and covered with the Lamb's blood in this world now, but we're going to be changed from glory to glory. It's going to get better, brothers and sisters. It's going to get a lot better. We have that hope. We are new creations now. And we're going to get an incorruptible body and we're going to live forever with Christ in heaven and all our brothers and sisters. We are one in Christ. We are holy without fault. We're adopted as God's children. I mean, that's only a few of them. That's, that's our hope. That's our promise from the one who cannot lie. So... We triumphed, but how did we do it? By the blood of the Lamb. 
we are literally dripping wet with the cleansing, perfect, acceptable to God Almighty blood of Jesus head to toe. Hallelujah. And Satan hates us for it. He does. You got to flip the script, guys. You got to get into the spirit world and see things as what's happening in the spirit world. In the spirit world, I am covered head to toe with the blood of the Lamb. And so are you if you're in Christ. If you said yes to Jesus, you're covered from head to toe with his blood. Okay? Washed clean. So that's how you triumph. Go to 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. Second Corinthians 1, 20 through 22. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set us he has set his seal of ownership on us. And here's the key. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Brothers and sisters, what's to come? Is not the, the hope of heaven waiting for us? Is not the hope of heaven what sustains us through this life? He gives us strength and power in Jesus' name, knowing that he's got our back for all eternity. Isn't, isn't that what gets us up in the morning and allows us to live a victorious life? And when we fall, to run to him and say, Lord, help me, forgive me. Isn't that what does it for us? The hope of heaven and Christ in us? The power of his Holy Spirit? That's how it, that's how it works. At least I know that's how it works in my life. And I think you can give testimony to that too. So this, this thing about the blood of the Lamb, it's incredible. I'm going to tell you a little story. Anybody know David Meek? His father told me a story. Actually, I think it was John Jr. that told me this story. One day David was, this was years ago, you all know the S-curves going to Lolo. David Meek was driving those S-curves. And he comes around the last one and the Bitterroot Valley opened up to him. Lolo was right there. All of a sudden, he sees a eight-story tall demon straddling the highway. And he looks at him, and the demon makes eye contact with David. And the demon goes, no! And David drove right underneath him. Pulled off the side of the road, got out, and it was gone. And he called his dad, John Sr., who was a pastor. You, many of you know John Sr., he goes, Dad, what was that? And John said, well, David, I think the Lord allowed you to see the strong man of the Bitterroot Valley. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities of the spirit world. They're real, okay? I won't go into it, but I've had my own things with them. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We're covered head to toe dripping wet with the cleansing blood of God Almighty through His Son, Jesus. That demon, that eight-story tall demon, had to hide his eyes because the light of Christ shining out through David was so bright that he couldn't look at it. Praise God. Praise God. Is that not victory? We carry that same Holy Spirit in us, and we carry that same blood covering if we said yes to Jesus. 
And you can say yes to Jesus tonight if you haven't. He is available to you right now. So, they overcame <laughs> by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. How many know when you speak the words of Jesus, they have power? They go out with authority. Amen. Right. <laughs> so this testimony that we have to share, we need to speak it. Whenever and wherever God gives you opportunity, we need to be ready to give that account of the hope that is within us the Word talks about. Brothers and sisters in Christ, heaven is our hope. We should not be ashamed to, to speak the hope of heaven within us. Let's turn to Matthew 6, 19. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. Anybody know what vermin are? I know we're not in the south, but do you know what vermin are? Okay. Rodents? Okay, that's a good enough word. Squirrels, vermins. The ones that eat things like the wires in your car. I hate them little Mises to pieces. Where vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Is heaven not our hope? Or is it like I once did? Are we holding on to earth too tightly? See, we're supposed to be aliens. In fact, we are aliens of this world. We're foreigners. We're strangers here. We're not supposed to feel overly comfortable on this earth. Because we've been bought with a price. Our names are written in the heavenly places. Sealed by the blood of the Lamb. That's where we're going. This is where we are. So what are we putting before God in our lives? What are we placing before Him? You know, He is a jealous God. He says, I will have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Lord gave me a song, a wedding song for a couple one time, and the bridge says, to the song says, and I do promise that I'll put you first after the Lord of my life. For there can be no one above him. No, not even my wife. So are you putting your wife above him? It's easy to do. Your wife is right there, you can hug her. Are you putting your kids above him? It's easy to do. But God's a jealous God. He says, I will have no gods. You're supposed to have no gods before me. I will be number one. He says, I will be your first love. That brand new Corvette or the 62 model, that can't be number one either. That grand piano, as beautiful as it is and as nice as it sounds, it can't be number one. The music that comes out of it can't be number one. If we hold on to this world lightly and hold on to Jesus firmly, that's the ticket. That's the way we live a victorious life. Amen? That's right. So our testimony. What is our testimony? Well, you know your testimony is when you came to the Lord and how that happened. But that's just the first one. I'm going to read you a real quick letter that my insurance guy sent me. Dear Stan, in February of 21, I was driving home from work one evening after dark. I was curving to the north on a new highway that had just been finished. I was high in the air on this one lane section when I ran over something. 
It caused a loud explosive boom from the back of my car and it sounded like a serious blowout or something and it scared me to death. It was possible that I was getting ready to lose control of the car and go off of this high point on the highway. I didn't want to have to wait long for a record to come and get me if I was safe stopping and there was no shoulder to pull over. It was scary and I prayed immediately. But nothing changed. I continued to have total control of the vehicle. There were no sounds indicating a flat tire or any problems at all. I continued to drive to my home, which was six miles away. However, a short distance from my house, I heard the air starting to leave the tire and felt the difference you feel when the tire is going flat. All of the air was gone as I pulled up into my driveway stopped right at my front door. The next morning I called a friend and took my car down there and he checked it over. Uh, he brought a record and took, took it down and checked it over. He called me later after examining my vehicle and talked to me about what had happened the night before. He told me that there was no way that I would have driven six miles on a tire with a three inch hole in the side of it. He was amazed when I told him that there was no problem with my car at all until I pulled up in the front of the house. And we both had no choice but to accept the fact that my prayer was answered. God heard me and simply kept the air in my tire <laughs> until I got home. It makes me cry just thinking about it as I write this to you. He does millions of things like this every day. When he chooses to answer our prayer, do we acknowledge it? Do we give him the credit and the glory and thank him profusely? Or do we take it for granted like nine out of 10 lepers did when Jesus healed them all? An answered prayer is a gift from God and it's a testimony. Our testimony is not just our story of how we came to love the Lord Jesus. It's also our walk, our rejoicing in those little miracles day to day as well. Sometimes we overlook these. Sometimes we forget to thank him for the unanswered prayers. That if we'd have gotten it, we'd have been worse off. Sometimes we forget to thank him for the answered prayers too. So, Let's not shirk back from giving our testimony. Let's look for opportunities and live our life as a testimony to Jesus so the world can see because they need to know him. It's a lost and dying world. And the last part of the verse that we talked about in Revelation was the part where it says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You know, the disciples, every one of them, died a horrible, painful death. Andrew took the gospel to modern day the Soviet Union, where he was crucified. Thomas preached the gospel as far east as India and died when he was pierced through by swords and spears of four soldiers, just like Christ. Christ was pierced. Philip preached in North Africa where he was arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some say he was not martyred, but others claim that he was stabbed to death. Bartholomew traveled extensively preaching the gospel and in the end was killed for his faith. James ministered in Syria. He was stoned and clubbed to death. Simon ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to worship the sun god. Matthias, who replaced Judas, preached in Syria with Andrew and was burned to death. John was the only apostle who was thought to have died a natural death of old age. He was a leader in the church of Ephesus and took care of Jesus' mother Mary. You remember her ask, Jesus asking him to do that on the cross. 
he was faithful. He was then persecuted and was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation that we quoted from tonight. And Paul, what about Paul? Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. God used mightily leading the church in Rome with Peter. He wrote many New Testament books. And he was killed by being beheaded. Heaven is our home. We are not to make this world our home. We are aliens, foreigners here. We're not of this world. We've been bought with a price. Our lives are not our own. The cost was the most expensive price paid for anything in the history of mankind, the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are his, and he is ours. And I want to finish with uh, Paul's writing in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Can you say today? Yep. They will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Let me ask you, what is your ministry? That's a question you should put before God. Maybe some of you know a part of it. Ask him for more. Lord, where do you want me? Everybody's got one. Too. Everybody's got one. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I, talking about Paul, Paul says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only for me, but also for all who have longed for his appearing. Brothers and sisters, we're covered with the blood of the living God, his son Jesus from head to toe, and Satan hates us for it. We are to give our testimony and be overcomers by that blood and by that testimony. So that's my encouragement with you tonight, that by the grace of God, that you can live for him. And I ask for your encouragement for me, that I might do that as well, whatever days he has for me to live out on this earth. Praise God. God bless all of you.